Welcome to Slash Forward. In this episode, we're going to have another night out with Fred Decker's 1986 classic, Night of the Creeps. In the process of doing so, if you find yourself enjoying the video, I'd love to have you as a subscriber. Let's get to it. We open on the event horizon where a group of naked babies with cauterized buttholes are engaged in a firefight. While the two aggressors try to blast their way through a blast door, the main baby fires off a canister into space. Meanwhile, on Sorority Row, Johnny takes Pam to make out point in his convertible because he likes to be watched. As Officer Ray warns the kids of a psycho on the loose, he's shook to see his ex-Pam so quickly in the arms of another man. They go to wish upon a flaming canister which seems to touch down nearby. John drives to the trailhead and hikes off in the search of a potential space circuit. And they both suffer horrible fates as Pam gets axe murdered while Johnny gets deep throated with nobody watching. Flash forward to 1986, we see Chris and JC lamenting their social status amidst a series of parties at which they would likely never be invited. But when Chris spies his ideal woman, they beeline for the beta house. JC proves to be the ultimate wingman, laying a distraction to gather intel on Cynthia. Although she is dating someone, JC declines to tell Chris, knowing he would wuss out. They figure the most direct path to her heart is pledging beta, but they don't fit the type so they're sent on what's intended to be an impossible mission. At the school's secret lab, we see scientists forget his secret code, so he gets on the horn with his lab partner for help. JC finishes him off and the boys find themselves in a room with a cadaver, exactly what they needed. Not one to look a gift horse in the mouth, JC starts hitting buttons to free the specimen. They begin to make off with their prize, but he reanimates, causing them to run out screaming instead, and Johnny begins to transfer his seed. We transition to Officer Ray, reliving an old trauma. Now going by Detective Cameron, he's called to the scene of the lab break-in. Shows up, hits him with a one-liner, and his catchphrase. Thrill me. And then busts some chops about the shoddy crime scene work as he stubs a butt out right in the middle of it. Meanwhile, the missing cadaver, knowing only the lust of his youth, shows up at Pam's room, which is now occupied by Cindy. By the time the police show up, he's back to cadaver form, but with a bifurcated face, giving the detective flashbacks of axe wounds. The next morning, Brad shows up, looking like an eerie and wet dream. Upset the boys took the stunt so far, in front of the wrong house and traumatizing his girl Cindy. But they confirm they chickened out, and when JC gets a bit too mouthy, Brad demonstrates that he's the absolute worst, breaking an unspoken rule, and Cindy breaks up with him in stylish fashion. The boys are then picked up for questioning, and Chris promptly fesses up to their part of the affair. The story checks out and that the witness saw them running from the scene, Sans corpse. While at the morgue, scientist wakes up mid-autopsy, spreading his worms while we also see slugs skittering all over campus. Cindy tries to confide in the boys since no one believes her story of walking cadavers. JC gives them some time alone as Chris walks her home. In the bathroom, he's confronted with a problem and opts to set himself on fire to avoid being forcibly entered. He fails, but discovers in the process that fire is the solution. If only he could make it out of the- eh, never mind. Back at the house, Cindy's made to feel stupid about her concerns, so she invites Chris to take her to the big dance. Cameron hears everything and invites Chris back to his bachelor pad for the talk, at which point he recounts his 1959 vengeance killing of the axe murderer. Should you be telling me this? Probably not. He his body in a plastic bag. Oh, okay. Point being, he buried the psycho where the house mother's cottage now resides. And he wants out. The cops get the call and begin a search of the surrounding area, but like always, you don't find what you're looking for until you stop searching. Now, they're all witnesses to a reanimation, and when the detective pops his head like a pinata, the sluggish bounty they're in. Meanwhile, Chris finds a tape JC left behind. He feels the critters creeping around inside of him and reveals that fire is the key to their destruction. As a result, he's opted for self-immolation. Chris finds him near the campus incinerator, and this time, JC stays dead. Chris runs to the detective to share the good news, and they head to the armory, where they have a longer than necessary social interaction, because a good director gives Dick Miller some room to breathe. They offer up shotgun tradesies in order to requisition a flamethrower. On campus, Cindy tries to let Brad down easy as he becomes a slug vending machine. The boys show up just in time to split his head open and fry the contents. Cameron runs upstairs to warn the girls and gets a chance to utilize his improvisational skills. And when Karen starts acting like a true Karen, He's nearly overtaken, but goes berserker mode and comes through. Outside, the kids are successfully busting heads, laying waste to all the slug-induced zombies converging on their location. They see the slugs are all heading into the basement. When they arrive, Cameron's already got the situation under control, and he gives them a slow count to get out of there before blowing himself. They celebrate in the aftermath as Cameron, now host to slugs, saunters down the road and spills his cranial contents into a nearby cemetery. And that was Night of the Creeps, one of several movies for which Fred Decker doesn't get nearly enough credit. If you enjoyed the video, I'd love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.